Hey, this is Patrick Hoffman where they sit and talk on papal infallibility. What is papal infallibility? Well, here's what it isn't. It isn't impeccability. It doesn't mean that the Pope can't sin. It also doesn't mean that every single thing the Pope says, everything he opines on, everything he says in a homily or in an airplane press conference is going to be absolutely true. That is not within the limits or the purview of the gift of infallibility. So what is it? Infallibility is the negative protection against error. It's part of the deposit of faith promised to us by Jesus Christ when he said in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke 10, 16, he who hears you hears me. All through John's Gospel, especially from, say, John 14 through 17, our Lord promises the Holy Spirit to be with the church, to remind the church of everything that he taught. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, before Jesus ascends back into heaven. He says, go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in, uh, in, the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you until the end of the age. The I there is a reference to the Holy Spirit. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to be with the church. Now, the Holy Spirit is God, and God is truth. So the, the main way to understand infallibility is to think of it as the mechanism by which Jesus protects you and I from being orphans. There are many things that Christ did not teach upon directly. He didn't mention infant baptism directly. He didn't mention masturbation or pornography or first strike limited uh, nuclear war or uh, whether cloning was a good idea. He doesn't even mention which books belong in the Bible. But he did leave the deposit of faith to the church, primarily through Peter and Peter's successors. In Matthew 16, when Peter gets the right answer to the question, who do you say that I am? Our Lord first starts with a kind of a gallop poll. Who do men say that I am? Like, what's the, what's the scuttlebutt? What's the word on the street about me? And Simon Peter gets the, the right answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus points to him. And that's when he changes his name. Simon, uh, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Therefore, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's Jesus setting up Peter as his vicar, his representative, the rock upon which Jesus will build his church. It's not Peter's church. It's not your church. It's not Patrick's church. It's the church of Jesus. And he deputizes Peter to be the leader of the church in his stead because he knows he's going to suffer and die and go to heaven. And he knows he's going to send the Holy Spirit. But while Christ invisibly rules the church, Peter and his successors visibly rule the church. Now, the last time the most extraordinary exercise of infallibility was given to the church was in 1950 when Pius XII defined the, the bodily assumption of the Blessed Virgin into heaven, body and soul. That had been believed since apostolic times, but it had never been given the, the crystalline, sort of finessed, formal definition until 1950. And that was as a result of um, an effort among many lay people in, in most countries of the world to, to define this. And so he did, 1950. Before that, it was 1854 with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So as in 1950, we have Our Lady's, the end of her life after she died and was assumed into heaven. So in 1854, you have the definition of the Immaculate Conception, which is the beginning of her existence. Not her birth, her conception in the womb of her mother, St. Anne, in which God, by a singular grace, preserved her in anticipation for the coming of Christ, the Savior, preserved her from all stain of sin, actual and original. That is the dogma of the um, Immaculate Conception. It's another misconception, pardon the phrase. When people think of the Immaculate Conception, they often mistake it for the virgin birth. So those are two examples of, of the extraordinary magisterium of the church, something being pronounced ex cathedra or from the chair. And it's rather rare. Another way the church teaches infallibly is through ecumenical councils. Vatican II in the 1960s, from 1962 to 65, was the last ecumenical council. Now, it was not a dogmatic council. It was a pastoral council. But it did have some doctrinally binding teachings. For instance, the teaching that in uh, Lumen Gentium, number 25, we read that the Pope's pronouncements, even when not ex cathedra, deserve our religious assent. 
of mind and will. So the teachings of ecumenical councils are binding, like Trent, Vatican I, Council of Florence, Council of Lyon. Um, there have been 23 of them, I think 23. Uh, they also express the infallible teachings of the church. Papal addresses, homilies, interviews, and so on, are not covered under infallibility. You cannot say that the Pope's opinion on baseball scores or the Dow Jones or even certain questions of economics or science are necessarily under the, the purview of infallibility. They certainly are not. The church leaves to science the work of scientists and leaves to questions of morality and liturgy and the sacraments and dogma to the church. Now, the church can govern the limits of science, but we don't want a repeat of the Galileo affair. I should do a whole other video in the future, and I probably will, on the Galileo affair, because it's another point of multiple misunderstandings, the relationship between faith and science. So infallibility can also uh, be covered under what's called the ordinary magisterium, not the ordinary, the extraordinary magisterium, like a, uh, a dogmatic definition or the teachings of an ecumenical council, but the ordinary magisterium has to do with what is taught as required to be believed or done that's been taught everywhere, always by everyone. So the common teaching of the church, for instance, in 1968, 50 years ago, the encyclical Humana Vitae was released by soon-to-be Pope uh, Paul VI. That document was not infallible, but the norms that it repeated and articulated then are infallible. They've never been challenged by, by reliable magisterial uh, uh, teachers, theologians. Um, every pope who's ever pronounced upon it has said the same thing. So we can have doctrine that develops, but we can't have doctrine that contradicts. And the teaching on contraception is an example of a doctrine that's never been contradicted. It's only been more and more forcefully and articulately explained by the popes throughout history. Now, when we come to Pope Francis, we, we run into a little bit of a crisis because some of his teachings have seemed to provide at least a tension between what's already been taught and what he's presenting. Uh, a good example is the, the reboot or the change of the phrasing of the death penalty in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. He is now teaching in that instrument of the Catechism that the death penalty is inadmissible in all cases, which strongly suggests that it's intrinsically wrong. He doesn't say it, but that's the, the presupposition that many commentators have drawn, that he's saying now Catholic uh, development of doctrine on this has changed so that something that was permitted and strongly endorsed in the past is now forbidden because it's wrong. Well, that's a problem. It's a problem because God himself set up the death penalty. He executed it many times in scripture. Popes and councils and theologians like Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine and others have strongly affirmed it throughout time. Uh, Ed Fazer talks about this in his book that we've uh, discussed on the show before. Um, another example is the question of global warming, now called climate change, which he inserted into the Apostolic Exhortation, Laudato Si. That is also problematic because we can't make binding what scientists themselves have not had universal agreement on. It's interesting, isn't it, that we, we think of science as infallible, when in fact science is in a constant state of correcting itself and readjusting theories. So... Um, maybe another example would be the teaching of the Catholic Church with respect to divorce and remarriage and the reception of Holy Communion. It was the teaching of St. John Paul II in Familiaris Consortio and elsewhere, also in the Catechism, that because Christ made marriage infallible, in other words, divorce and remarriage is an impossibility, you could think of the, the Church's attitude toward divorce is sort of like her attitude toward the tooth fairy. It doesn't exist. It's a superstition. So when couples do, who are validly married divorce and remarry, that by definition is adultery because Christ himself in Matthew 19 and elsewhere in the Gospels taught that if you marry someone, divorce them and marry someone else, you commit adultery. Those are the, that's a hard saying, but that's the teaching of Christ. Just read Matthew chapter 19. Well, in Amoris Laetitia, number 8, 
with a couple of confusing footnotes, we seem to have a different teaching in which the divorce and remarriage uh, does not necessarily provide an obstacle to receiving Holy Communion. So the church today is in a crisis. There are things that are undefined. There's a path forward, I believe, because Christ will never abandon his church. But in the meantime, we have to live with the tension of something always having been true and now being somewhat challenged by the, the opinions of the Holy Father and some of the people he surrounded himself with. But this is something we will get through. This will correct itself. Whether Bishop Cressida's case that the election itself was invalid in 2013, or whether there will be amendments to the teachings um, such that Catholics can now rely with firm certainty that what is being taught is reflective of the attitude of Christ, I'm not sure how it's going to work out. But I do know that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he did send the Holy Spirit to be with the church, and this time of confusion is also a time of testing of our faith. Who do we belong to? What's our identity? Do we belong to Paul? Do we belong to Apollos? Do we belong to, you know, Team Bergoglio? Are we Team Traditionalist? Are we Team Progressive? Or do we first of all belong to Christ? We have to cling to him. Now, he seems to be asleep in the boat, doesn't he? Our Lord seems to be napping in the boat. But Jesus asleep with us in the boat is sufficient to take care of us. Because it's the Son of God with us, even though he's napping. Napping for Jesus is not an obstacle to his great, powerful presence. And that's the thing we need to rely on. We're going to get through the storm of the sexual abuse crisis. There's already a purification beginning, and it's just getting rolling. There will be more attorneys general. There will be more grand jury reports, and more cockroaches will be caught in the sunlight, and it'll all to be the good. Will the church be smaller in the future? It probably will, as young Father Joseph Ratzinger said so many years ago. But the church has expanded and receded in size in various parts of the world all throughout her history. And this is one of those times where the uncertain present is going to give way to the certainty and the reaffirmation of what the church has always taught. So this is temporary. So we cling to Christ, we rely on his promises, and we hug our kids all the more frequently. In the meantime, be a saint. What else is there?